in, well, with his family in debtor's prison. Oh, I forgot about yeah. debtor's prison. Yep. Debtor's prison <sighs> was a big part of the industrial revolution and part of that kind of continuous circle of poverty. Cause if you weren't on it, if you were unable to be pay your debts, you went to debtor's prison or a workhouse. And oftentimes if it was the father or the primary breadwinner that had to go to said debtor's prison, if they owned a shop or ran a shop or things like that, the shop would essentially be stuck. They couldn't run it without them. Like if it was like a blacksmith or. Yeah. And if your business closes down, how can you make money to pay your debts? Exactly. And then it's just that whole never ending circle of poverty. And then whatever family you had living outside of the debtor's prison is going to be coming with you because they're going to be falling into poverty and have nowhere to go. So again, poverty is the underlying villain here. Yeah. Um, Child wages were often low. The wages were as little as 10 to 20% of an adult male's wage. So that's lovely. That is really small. Yeah. Because what were they going to do? They weren't going to riot. They weren't going to unionize. They needed every bit of money that they could bring into the home. Mm -hmm. Um, Karl Marx was an outspoken opponent of child labor, saying that British industries could live by sucking blood and children's blood, too. And that U.S. capital was financed by the capitalized blood of children. Uh, Leticia Elizabeth Landon, who was a poet at the time, castigated child labor in her 1835 poem, The Factory, portions of which she pointedly included her 18th birthday tribute to Princess Victoria in 1837. That sounds familiar. I think I've heard Uh, of that. On the somewhat plus side, throughout the second half of the 19th century, child labor began to decline in industrialized societies due to regulation and economic factors because of the growth of trade unions. Well, good. Whatever the reason, good. (laughs) The regulation of child labor began from the earliest days of the Industrial Revolution. The first act to regulate child labor was in Britain, and it was passed in 1803. As early as 1802 and 1819, Factory acts were passed to regulate the working hours of workhouse children in factories and cotton mills to 12 hours per day. This was shortening their days. Yeah, only 12. Yeah. These acts were largely ineffective after radical agitation by, for example, the short time committees in 1831. A royal commission recommended that children aged 11 to 18 should work a maximum of 12 hours per day. Children 9 to 11 a maximum of eight hours to it per day and children under the age of nine were no longer permitted to work. Well, that's something. That's something. This act, however, only applied to the textile industry. And then further agitation led to another act in 1847, limiting both adults and children to 10 hour work days, period. Someone named Lord Shaftesbury was an outspoken advocate of regulating child labor to try to just get rid of it. What a name. Um, okay. As technology improved and pro- proliferated, there was a greater need for educated employees. This saw an increase in schooling with the eventual introduction of compulsory schooling. So the improved technology and automation also made child labor redundant. Wait, hold on. I'm processing so, that. Like first I'm like, yeah, compulsory mm-hmm. school. And I'm like, wait, hold on. No. So it really <laughs> is just, like churning out workers school is really just it kind out of workers. is like the no. work i don't like that either yes but it's but still better higher better. educated workers yeah i know i know i know it's not better but it is better but it is not it's like i said like poverty and capitalism and money and greed is just kind of like the underlying villains here So in the early 20th century, thousands of boys were employed in glassmaking industries. Glassmaking was a dangerous and tough job, especially without the current technology, because it it, it requires intense heat to melt glass. So 3,133 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,723 degrees Celsius, which is very hot. We went to a glassmaking museum on our honeymoon and they did like a demonstration and like that shit is hot. Oh, yeah. Like even if you see the videos on YouTube of like somebody blowing glass, it's like 
how is that so bright? Like, even though this is on a video, it is hurting my eyes with how bright that, that molten sand that is turned into glass is. Okay, so what could be good about being exposed to that heat? Absolutely nothing. This could cause eye trouble, because again, bright as fuck. Lung ailments, because mm. you're blowing and heat. Heat exhaustion, which I'm sorry, that's a given. Duh, yeah, obviously. Um, cuts and burns. And since workers were paid by the piece, they had to work productively for hours without a break. So they weren't paid by the hour. They were paid by the piece. That's annoying. And then since the furnaces had to be constantly burning, there were night shifts from 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. And many factory owners preferred boys under the 16 years of age. Why? I, it didn't tell me why, but... I guess maybe after 16, they're like, this is bullshit. You should pay us more. Or, you know, I guess the closer to 16, the closer they were to what they considered to be an adult male who could demand higher wages and better Mm. conditions. Because, you know, the kids aren't going to rise up and fight. But age 16 and up, they're, they're men, quote unquote, at this point. And less easy to exploit and take advantage of, I guess. Could be that. Um, an estimated 1.7 million children under the age of 15 were employed in American industry by 1900, which is disgusting. That's a lot. In 1910, over 2 million children in the same age group were employed in the United States. This includes children who rolled cigarettes, engaged mm-hmm. in factory work, worked as bobbin doffers in textile mills, <laughs> worked in coal mines, and were employed employed canneries yes i know the bob and doffer well that was that's the actual name of remember when i was talking about my great-grandmother and how she lost the tip of her finger because she had to pull the bobbin out that's what that is a bob and doffer because like the the thread is on a bobbin right like if you've ever seen like an old-timey sewing machine Mm -hmm. the thread is on that spool that's called a bobbin so when the textiles are being made the bobbins have are bouncing up and down because it's the thread on them. Once that's out, you have to take out the empty one and put in another full one quickly so it doesn't interrupt the um, oh, textile manufacturing. The process. So you're taking out empty bobbins, replacing them with the full bobbins. And that's how she got her finger stuck and she lost the tip of her finger and she got sent home for the day. And her father, my great great grandfather, was pissed that she wouldn't be paid for a full day's work because he was an asshole. Insane. (laughs) He was more concerned about the money than he was about his daughter's hand. Not cool, man. Not cool. You know, my grandmother said he was such, she, he said that he was such an asshole and like such like a miserly guy. I guess when she was little, he was giving her a nickel for her birthday. Like, you know, happy birthday. Here's your present. It's a nickel, whatever. Yeah. And she went to take it from him. And it was literally like the stereotypical miserly old man holding on so tight to the coin. He doesn't actually want to let it go. And she had to almost yank it out of his hand. What? And this was like her birthday present. She was even as a kid thinking, you're an asshole. You can keep it. I don't need the money that bad. Yeah. Jesus. But yeah can you imagine like pinching onto that coin so hard that you don't want to give your grandchild their birthday present? Talk about pinching yeah. pennies. Real gem of a hue. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently in this one, it was nickels. Same difference. <laughs> obviously he was long gone before I came along or my mother or anyone, but mm-hmm. still not a great guy. Yeah. Um, there's actually a collection of pictures from Lewis Hines. He did photographs of child laborers in the 1910s. And he did this to evoke a kind of obviously like a emotional response to the plight of the working children in the American South. Mm -hmm. He took these photos between 1908 and 1917 as the staff for the national child labor committee. And I've seen these and like the link will attach um, in the show notes, Mm. but it is intense, man. Like there's a picture of like a little girl holding this big bucket that she's shucking oysters and that's her job. And she's like six and she's holding an oyster shucking knife. Whoa. And this is literally her job. That's all she can do. Sun up to sundown is what she's doing 
she, she's not going to school. She's potentially going to cut off a finger if she's not careful. And she's shucking oysters for a living. At six. At six. Yeah. Crazy. And of course, there's pictures of boys working at a glass factory, kids working in coal mines. Um, they do have a picture of a bobbin doffer. Um, and I was like, well, I wonder if that's my great grandma. Oh, wait, that was in Missouri. No, she did not live in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it was, it's, they're kind of intense images. Um, but that was taken for the National Child Labor Committee. So at least we know in the early 1900s, people are like, this is not cool. They're trying to get publicity so that we can be like, this has got to stop. Yeah. Um, so with the high percentage of children working, the rising of literacy and the lack of formal education, this became a widespread issue for many children who worked to provide for their families. Due to this problematic trend, many parents developed a change of opinion when deciding whether or not to send their children to work. Other factors that led to the decline of child labor included financial changes in the economy, changes in the development of technology, raised wages, continuous regulations on factory legislation. Um, in 1933, Britain adopted a legislation restricting the use of children under 14 in employment. This was called the Children and Young Persons Act, 1933. They defined the term child as anyone of compulsory school age, which then was age 16, well, up to age 16. In general, no child may be employed under the age of 15 or 14 years for light work. Okay. Very often, though, these laws were not enforced. Federal legislation was passed in the United States in 1916 and again in 1919, but both laws were declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. I don't know why. I, yeah. Someone, oh. someone has to explain that to me. Although the number of child workers declined dramatically during the 1920s and 1930s, it is not until the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938 that the federal regulation of child labor finally became a reality in this country. Okay. So child labor is a thing of the past, right? Just coal-stained Victorian children and nothing in the modern era, right? Yeah, I can tell by your tone that that's not true. I mean, I would love to say yes, but of course we know that isn't the case. Right. I mean, we've all heard stories of the sweatshops and diamond mines used today using forced labor. Nestle is under fire for using uh, children. What? And kind of what is what amounts to potential slave labor? Yeah, Nestle. And I then like, out of it. I did not know that. <laughs> there, I have a whole list. I have a whole list of companies in the modern world that have been either cited, accused, or haven't been embroiled in some kind of child labor scandal. Wow. Um, the big one with Nestle right now is the use of underage laborers. And then the biggest one is what's essentially slavery. Cause it's one of those things where it's kind of like indentured servitude mm. and Nestle is partnering, partnering with these people or these companies in the coca cocoa fields that they know are doing this and they're not, not partnering with these people. And then some is CEO CEO got really like under fire as he should have been for saying like, you know, well, if you don't want us to use slaves, then we're going to have to raise the price of chocolate. It's like, Oh God. Are you fucking kidding me? Apparently he's not. Chocolate, you asshole. Jesus. <laughs> but he's trying to basically say in order to prevent us passing on the inflation costs to the consumer, we have to find cheap labor alternatives. And I'm like, okay, there's a difference between cheap labor alternatives and indentured servitude, child labor, what is essentially exploitation. Right? No about it. You are raking in billions, Mr. CEO. Why don't you go work in the cocoa fields for a while and see how that feels? So again, the real villain twirling their mustache and forcing babies into mines, capitalism and poverty. Fantastic. So here's the part where we kind of get into an uncomfy grayish area okay. because this, I, I put this in here 
because it's an interesting talking point.